So we're going to move on and talk about a virus that most of you have heard about in the news recently. It's the Zika virus. Um, this is a really interesting area because it's a virus that's been around that we have known about for at least 70 years, and yet we don't really know much about what it does and how it does it. But we have most recently heard from the Centers for Disease Control that it has been implicated through epidemiologic correlates as a definitive cause of microcephaly in, in infants of, of pregnant women who have been infected. And so we are very uh, excited to have Dr. Desiree Labode, who's an associate professor here in my division. I was very fortunate to uh, recruit her to Stanford about a year and a half ago. It hasn't been long, but she's already making a major mark in her area. She's a pediatric arbovirologist, so works in areas around flaviviruses, which are related to the Zika and, and other viruses as well that are, are transmitted by mosquitoes. So welcome uh, to Desiree. Hi. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about Zika virus. Um, I really believe that we're living in interesting times right now. This is the first time in my life that I've been able to witness the discovery of a novel teratogen, um, a new congenital infection. Some of you in the audience may remember when rubella was discovered. It sort of mirrored what we're seeing now with Zika. Um, and as a mother of three, I can say that Baseline, I think pregnancy is a time of a lot of anxiety um, because there's no control there. There's so many unknowns. We've been talking about this over the last couple of days. There's so many things that can go wrong. Most of the time, things turn out right. It's a miracle, the miracle of life. Um, but now we're sort of witnessing when things go wrong. And there are a lot of pregnant women right now in the Americas that are, their pregnancies have become a terrifying state for them. And so we're going to learn a little bit about Zika today and just keep them in your mind as, as we talk about this today. So I'm going to start just with a little bit of arbovirus background for those of you who are not um, familiar with arboviruses in general, and then we'll move on to talk a little bit about arboviral disease emergence, and we've seen a lot of these viruses over the last couple of decades, so I'll talk about that. And then the meat of the talk will really be focused on Zika virus infection. I'll bring up background, we'll talk about the current outbreaks, and then we'll discuss transmission, risk factors, and then some more clinical data, you know, how do we diagnose it, what can we do treatment-wise, and then I'll finish up talking about really the future of, of Zika research. First, what are arboviruses? Arbovirus stands for arthropod-borne virus, and these are viruses that require a blood-sucking arthropod to complete their life cycle. Many of these infections are zoonotic, which means that they can impact humans, but also a lot of animal species and it can have harmful effects in those animal species. We know of about 500 viruses to date, and they come from eight very diverse viral families, but three viral families in particular, the Flaviviridae, the Togaviridae, and the Bunyaviridae are what are responsible for most of the human disease when it comes to arboviruses. I put up some life cycles here, just, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but just to demonstrate to you how different life cycles can be. You know, all of these viruses are spread by mosquitoes, but in fact, they have very different life cycles. And this becomes very important when you think about controlling these infections, because the vectors themselves, the mosquitoes, can have very different behaviors, which is important for vector control. If you look in the, in the far right, um, the, the, the bottom right corner, that's the West Nile cycle, and you can see there's this cycle between birds and and Culex mosquitoes that we sometimes get infected as accidental hosts. Compare that with Rift Valley fever on the left side, you can just see that these life cycles can be quite complicated. Now, the dengue life cycle, which is a flavivirus virus that's closely related to Zika, is in the upper right. And you can see that there was the sylvatic cycle that then led to an epidemic cycle. And that's pretty much what we're seeing with Zika. It's just this epidemic cycle. So it's the mosquito, Aedes aegypti, and humans. And humans then get infected from the vector and then are able to infect uninfected mosquitoes that then go on to become infected and then spread the disease to new humans. And so we don't need the sylvatic cycle to really feed this. This epidemic cycle can just cycle on its own, and that's what we're seeing. So let's just talk a minute about the vector, Aedes aegypti. This is what it looks like. It's actually a quite beautiful mosquito. It has these spots on its legs and its limbs. And um, this mosquito is, has really emerged over the last several the last several decades. You can see in the 1930s, it was um, widely distributed 
throughout Central and South America. And then by the 70s, it had really contracted, and that was really because of the use of DDT. Um, and then by 2000, again, it had emerged all over Central and South America. And you can see in the bottom panel there, um, we do have this vector in the United States. Um, we think that the reason why this, this mosquito spreader is spreading so rapidly might have something to do with insecticide or drug resistance. It could be that the planet's warming, maybe there's more habitats. And then finally, I think a lot of it has to do with the shift from prevention to emergency response. So instead of sort of surveying for these mosquitoes, trying to keep their populations as low as we can, we sort of um, only really put a lot of effort toward it once there's been an outbreak discovered, and that's often too late. There are some very specific uh, vector behaviors about this mosquito that make it a very efficient transmitter of disease to humans. So I just want to bring those up first. Um, the life cycle of the mosquito is quite rapid, so it goes from egg to adult in 13 days, sometimes in warm climates. That can happen in about seven days. So you can see all of a sudden you can have not thousands and millions of mosquitoes quite quickly. Um, the eggs are very, very hardy. They can remain dry. They're very desiccation resistant, and they can remain that way for years and still be infectious. Um, the mosquito is a bit of a homebody. It only flies about 100 meters from where it's born, and so um, that's important for control, but also just important to know that that very local environment, even in your backyard, is actually important to transmission risk for humans. Another thing about this mosquito is it's very anthropophilic, and what that means is it just prefers to feed on us. It loves human blood, um, unlike other mosquitoes, which sometimes feed on other species, of course. And finally, um, it prefers to breed in man-made containers. So if you have a flower pot in your backyard or a dog dish, it only takes about a tablespoon of water for this mosquito to lay her eggs and for them to develop. And so um, they just, they, they're homebodies and, and they love to live in and around human habitation. Finally, this mosquito is sort of a nervous Nelly. So when she bites you, if you happen to move your arm, she'll fly away and then she'll go bite another person, and another person. And it turns out, on average, it takes her about four to five bites for her to get enough blood and enough protein to have a successful oviposition. So that means she could have transmitted Zika, dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, whatever she might be carrying, to four or five people to just have one blood meal. Um, and these mosquitoes bite during the daytime. So many people say, oh, you know, mosquito nets. Well, mosquito nets work for the malaria vector, which is the Anopheles mosquito. But these mosquitoes, 80 species, bite during the daytime, dawn, dusk, and during the day. And so a net is not going to, to be the cure-all. We unfortunately have these vectors here in California. I'm just bringing a little home to you. So we have them in Menlo Park and Atherton. Um, and then also Aedes albopictus, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is, can also transmit many of the infections we're talking about, um, has also been found in Southern California. So this is Aedes albopictus, a close relative to Aedes aegypti. And this is the Asian tiger mosquito. It, it has a temperate distribution all throughout North America. And in the US, it's really expanded, again, very rapidly over the last few years. It was initial, initially introduced into Texas in the 80s. And then over about 20 years, it established itself in 26 states and 866 counties. And so this is just a map. The top is just showing the 80s Egypti distribution throughout the world, and the bottom is showing 80s albopictus. You can see in the United States, 80s albopictus is more of a problem for us. Are these infections important? Well, I'm, I'm here today talking at this very nice conference, so it must be important to someone, but actually these infections affect a lot of people. So over a million people die from mosquito-borne diseases every year, and that um, a lot of them are, um, are children. Children are at very high risk for these infections because they're outside and they're getting bitten by mosquitoes. We've seen what West Nile can do when it came here in 99 and how it spread across the U.S., causing a lot of impact in, in um, health costs. And so now there's more deadly arboviruses that are coming our way. Important to know, though, although these viruses are globally distributed, if you don't have the vector, you're not going to have the infection. Unfortunately, here in the US, we do have some of the vectors, so we need to pay attention. Over the last 20 years, we've really seen a dramatic resurgence of these infections, both in humans and in animal populations. And these are epidemics thought to be caused by arboviruses that we thought were under control, like Aedes aegypti. So Aedes aegypti is spreading dengue, yellow fever, and now Zika. Or other arboviruses that have expanded their geographic distribution, like West Nile when it came here in the 90s, or Rift Valley Fever as it's emerging in the Middle East, or chikungunya through the Americas and so forth. And there are also new viruses that are being discovered all the time. 
Why is this happening? I think a lot of it has to do with the influences of modern life. So we live in a much more urban than rural world now, and that has its implications. We change our planet all the time, deforestation, reforestation, land reclamation, irrigation projects, and so that, of course, can change vector habitats. Unfortunately, there's a lot of military activity and war in our world, and so that, of course, disrupts any sort of surveillance and control that might have been going on beforehand. Um, climate, extreme weather events, natural disasters, again, can alter habitats and make it possible for vectors to breed. And then finally, we have a very limited um, toolkit when it comes to vector control. And I'll bring this up at the very end of the talk. Not to mention, we live in a very small world, right? The world is small because everybody's moving all over the world all the time. And this is a picture of just 24 hours of air traffic in the world. And you can see two billion people travel on airplanes every year, and so can these infections. And this is exactly how viruses get around the world. Oftentimes, they come in a commercial jetliner in a person who's either having symptoms of their disease or not having symptoms. And they get, to their, they get back home with the person, and, or they go to a new place with that person, and if the vectors happen to be there to bite the person who has the virus in their blood, that's how outbreaks can begin. Now, West Nile, most of you remember West Nile, which, happened, which predates this slide when it, it came in 99. But you can see, these are, this is just a slide showing major re-emerging outbreaks, disease outbreaks, and many of them are actually arboviruses. So there's West Nile, which isn't even pictured, and then there's chikungunya. I don't know how many of you have heard of chikungunya, but it's a very important toga virus, which is um, emerging right now. Um, initial outbreaks were when it emerged in Europe, and then we're having outbreaks right now concurrent with Zika outbreaks, although you can't tell it from the news, but there are over two million cases right now of chikungunya virus in the Americas. This is the first time this virus has ever been outside of Africa and Southeast Asia, and it's emerging through the Americas and causing a lot of problems. This virus can cause very long-standing joint complications. And now we have Zika. So first there were the outbreaks in Yap in 2007, which is when I first heard about Zika, and now we have outbreaks in French Polynesia and Brazil and Colombia. So what is Zika virus? Well, as Bonnie mentioned, Zika is a flavivirus. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, and it's very closely related to dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, these other flaviviruses that we know of that have important impacts on human health. It was first isolated in 1947 when they were doing yellow fever research in the Zika virus of Uganda. So they, were, um, they had monkeys in cages, and they were looking at febrile monkeys, and they were actually trying to isolate yellow fever. And instead, they isolated and discovered a new virus, and they named it Zika because it was isolated in the Zika forest. Phylogenetic analysis really suggests that Zika is a new, kind of a newbie, a new virus, and originated as early as the 1920s. And there are two strains. There's the African strain and the Asian strain. And what's going through in the Americas right now is closely related to the Asian strain. As I've mentioned, it's transmitted by 80s mosquitoes, but of course there are other possible transmission methods, which is why I'm here talking to you today. So there are perinatal cases, which I'll be discussing. There's also transfusion-related risk. And then there's sexual transmission, which I won't spend a lot of time on, but other to say that there have been cases now confirmed of male to female sexually transmitted Zika. Um, and this is because serum, urine, and semen can harbor the virus for undetermined lengths of time. And this may is definitely a, a possible way of spread, but probably is not an important cause of the spread that we're seeing right now in the Americas. These are just some maps sort of showing um, I don't know, do we have a pointer? Probably not. Well, in the center there, where it says 1947, that's Uganda, and that, again, that's where the virus was initially isolated from this monkey. And then for the next 20 years or so, there were sporadic cases through Africa, a few human cases here or there. And it wasn't really until 2007, when the virus hit Yap, that it really um, started to garner some attention, at least in my field, among arbovirologists. Um, and that was because during the Yap outbreak, Although Yap, you maybe many of you have never heard of Yap, and I'll show you where it is, right here. It's at the top left there. It's a little Micronesian island. Um, but what was interesting about that outbreak is that 75% um, of the island was infected. So just such a high attack rate. There's only three or 4,000 people on the island, but still 75% of them. And so um, um, it really garnered a lot of attention. And then what happened is, you can see it sort of crossed the Pacific Ocean over time, ended up in Easter Island in 2014, and then in Brazil in May of 2015. And then since that time, it spread like wildfire, just like chikungunya, up and down um, into Central and South America. And right now, there's, over, there's about 2 million cases or so of Zika reported. 
So what does Zika look like normally? The reason why people weren't paying a lot of attention to this virus was because the clinical manifestations are usually quite mild. So just like dengue, about three quarters of the infections are asymptomatic. So if, you know, if four people get, have the virus in their blood, only one of them is going to have symptoms. And so um, the people who actually do have the symptoms, they sort of have what I call a dengue light syndrome. So it's really not as severe as dengue. It's maybe a couple days of, of, mo of high fever, but then it's only a couple days long. You may have an itchy red rash, um, red eyes, some muscle pain, some arthralgias, but then you get better pretty quickly. Severe disease is quite uncommon, and there haven't been any reported deaths due to Zika in um, adult populations. This is just some pictures just showing you sort of the types of rashes and the conjunctivitis that you can see with this infection. Now, why I'm here talking today, of course, is the link between Zika and microcephaly. So first, what is microcephaly? So microcephaly just means that the occipital frontal circumference, so the baby's head circumference, is less than third percentile based on standard growth charts for sex, age, and gestational age. It's generally a pretty rare condition, um, and babies are born with a small head, and or the head can just not progress in, in growth as time goes on. And of course, this can result in severe developmental delays. This is data that a Brazilian colleague shared with me um, early on um, when they first started to note um, this association with microcephaly. And so what we're looking at here, at the beginning of the, at the, at the, beginning of the, the time, you see that there's just this outbreak of rash and fever. And so the Brazilian government had seen dengue and chikungunya in the past, and so they were checking for all those things, but things were dengue negative. So they're, well, what is this, you know? And, and by, you can see it took several months, but then um, by the 21st week, Zika had been confirmed. And then they noticed several months later, of course, that there was this peak in, in microcephaly cases. And right now, there are supposedly more than 4,000 cases of microcephaly just in Brazil alone. And when you look here, you can go back and see that many of the women who delivered then with these microcephalic babies were probably infected in their first trimester. So there was this temporal association, nothing causal, but just a temporal uh, epidemiologic association. And then studies began to come out showing um, Zika virus being isolated in the amniotic fluid of babies who had microcephaly. And this happened in Brazil, and then also looking back in French Polynesia. And the babies that were born um, started, the, the abnormalities in the brain included brain atrophy, calcifications, um, problems with the cerebellum, the deep brain, corpus callosal problems, and so forth. So just really, um, really dysgenesis of, of the entire brain. And here's just some pictures just showing some of those calcifications, the very thin cortical structures, and then the dysgenesis of the corpus callosum in that bottom left um, panel. And then what really did it for me is when this New England Journal of Medicine article came out in February, um, really to sort of really try and give more evidence for causality here. And what we're looking at are, are ultra-thin sections of fetal brain, and um, we're looking at electron microscopy there on the left, and all those little circles are Zika virus particles in this fetus's brain. And what this case, um, I'm just going to go over this case briefly. So this was an expectant mother who had febrile, she was actually a European mom, but she had been living in Brazil for a while. And so she got pregnant in Brazil, and then during her first trimester, she, she had a rash and a fever, and then she went back home um, at 29 weeks and had an ultrasound done, and that showed microcephaly with calcifications and just um, uh, um, a very... Um, bad baby brain. And so the mother requested a late trimester um, termination. And so that was done at 32 weeks. And on fetal autopsy, so the, the fetus had microencephaly, almost complete agyria, hydrocephalus, calcifications everywhere, cortical displacement. Um, and then Zika, as I showed you in those initial panels, was detected in the brain tissue by PCR. And EM was confirmatory, just showing the virus in the right place. And then they were able to isolate the complete genome of Zika from this baby's brain. And even, um, also very important is the, the log titer of virus that was in the brain was so much higher than anywhere else in the baby's body, liver, spleen, all the other organs. It was really concentrated in the brain, just showing sort of the neurotropism of this virus. And this is um, pictures of that baby's brain. Again, you just see the calcifications, um, just... Um, of very thin cortical structures. And this has been, um, now there have been more and more papers just coming out with different types of scanning modalities, just showing all of the, um, the different um, 
um, congenital microcephaly cases and, and what um, is going on inside. So all of that was happening in Brazil. All these cases are happening in Brazil. And remember I told you there was this large um, outbreak in French Polynesia that followed the YAP outbreak in 2013. And so they decided, well, let's go back and see if we can, if, if this is just a Brazil thing, this microcephaly, or did, did it happen here too, but we just didn't notice when the outbreak was happening. So they actually went backwards. They did a retrospective review and tried to look for cases of congenital microcephaly during the time when they were having the Zika outbreaks in French Polynesia. And so what is shown here in this chart is 19 cases of, um, of babies with congenital microcephaly or brainstem dysfunction. And um, the bar, that kind of tan bar in the background, is the timing of the Zika virus outbreak in French Polynesia. Now, the little green squares are the symptoms, like so symptoms that the moms had that could be consistent with Zika virus, so fever and rash-like symptoms. And you can see that some of them had symptoms, but some of them don't recall any febrile illnesses during pregnancy. And the little red circles are um, the, the testing. They were actually able to go back and find um, um, a biobanks of some of the amniotic fluid samples from these moms and test them for Zika virus infection. You can see that the red circles mean that they tested positive, and then the open yellow circles were the ones that tested negative. But you can see, again, sort of that there were definitely more cases, they said, of microcephaly during this time than would be expected, and the best estimates of their rates were a 14-fold increase in congenital microcephaly during that Zika virus outbreak time, and a 31-fold increase in brainstem dysfunction among the children born during that time. So again, sort of more associated evidence. I want to bring this up. So is Zika virus the first congenital arboviral infection? I would say probably not. So it's, it's one that definitely is more common. It looks like it's happening more commonly with Zika virus. But although rarely studied, there are probably other arboviruses that have been implicated, at least in case reports, for congenital arboviral infections. And this includes Japanese encephalitis, dengue, Rifelli fever virus. Question on West Nile virus, there was one congenital case that seems pretty well suspected, but others that weren't confirmed. Yellow fever, chikungunya, and then some of the other encephalitides. I think why we're seeing um, this right now so strongly is that all of a sudden Zika hit a population that was completely naive, a very large population with a lot of pregnant women, and so we're actually able to pick up these patterns a lot easier. Recently, a couple of weeks ago, the New England Journal of Medicine released this report, which was really reviewing the evidence for causality. So it's always been this, again, epidemiologic association, temporal association with Zika and microcephaly, and they really wanted to say, you know, no flaviviruses has ever really been definitively shown to cause birth defects, you know, but so what's happening here is, can we really say this is causal? And you aren't going to be able to read this. What they did is they used Shepard's criteria, which is proof of teratogenicity in humans. It's, it's a set of criteria that you use to see if this is truly a teratogen. And you have to meet certain criteria in order to, to say that, yes, this definitely is a teratogen. And pretty much to, to, to be very brief about this, Zika did meet the criteria. So there was proven exposure to this agent during a critical time in development. There were con um, partially consistent findings during epidemiologic studies. There was careful delineation of clinical cases, and it seems like there are certain brain defects that are going with this. So again, that, that kind of in, um, increases the causal evidence. And then the fact that it's a rare environmental exposure and it's a rare defect. We're seeing something microcephaly, which is usually very, very rare, that all of a sudden is becoming much less rare because of, of, of this association. They also looked at a different set of criteria called the Bradford Hill criteria. And, and looking at these criteria, it didn't quite meet, but it almost met. And so they pretty much came out and said, you know, we really suggest that by this time, there's sufficient evidence to really causally link Zika virus with these cases of congenital microcephaly and other severe brain anomalies in these children. Um, and they say the lack of a, another alternative explanation also helps kind of um, increase this evidence. And so a week after this report was released, CDC came out and said Zika causes microcephaly. Um, I think one of the important basic research, that, some of the important basic research that helps sort of strengthen this causal relationship is identifying candidate receptors for the virus. And so there's this phosphatidylserine receptor that's on these neural progenitor stem cells, which actually acts as a Zika virus entry receptor. And so this work done in cell, and there have been other reports showing that this is not only just on neural stem cells, but also in the placenta and the syncytiotrophoblast, 
always sort of leads to um, more plausible scientific evidence that it's really getting in there and, and wreaking havoc. And so this paper just did single cell analysis showing the specificity um, of the candidate Zika receptors and showed that this specific receptor called Axel is actually strongly expressed during critical times in fetal brain development in the human radial glia, brain capillaries and microglia, and in the retinal progenitor cells. And so Zika can also cause a lot of eye problems, just like rubella could. Um, and so by preferentially destroying these radial glia cells, which then go on to be the founder of cell population that actually makes the neurons, the, the brain, um, that's how Zika produces these, these severe brain anomalies. Not only does Zika cause congenital microcephaly, but it can also um, cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. So I think many of you know what Guillain-Barre is. That's when the body um, starts to attack the myelin sheets, so the covering of the neurons and the peripheral nerves, and you get weakness in your peripheral nerves that can ascend and sometimes include your diaphragm, so that the big problem with Guillain-Barre is if that happens, and it happens in about a third of cases, then you need respiratory support in an ICU. And so before the cases of microcephaly actually came out in Brazil, what Bra I was at a meeting, um, and um, what the Brazilians were really worried about is we've seen Zika, you know, we, we know we have Zika now, and we're seeing all these cases of Guillain-Barre. We think Zika is really related to Guillain-Barre. And of course, that makes temporal sense, because this usually happens about six weeks after, whereas microcephaly came much later because all of those women had to go on to deliver. So they've looked, and in French Polynesia, they think the rates are about 20 times higher because of the Zika outbreak as far as Guillain-Barre, and then the same in Brazil, about 20 times increased risk um, for, for all the outbreaks that are going on currently. And so why is this happening? Well, um, a lot of viruses and different bacteria can, of, of course, cause Guillain-Barre. Um, there are some theories related to this. You know, Maybe there's just susceptibilities in these populations, but of course it's happening in many different areas, so that's probably less likely. Could it be that this virus maybe evolved and is now has you know, some different structural properties that, that cause it to be um, a more likely cause of Guillain-Barre, that's possible. There are a lot of people working on the virus and how it's changed over time, and it has changed. Um, and then finally, maybe there's some sequential immune stimulation here because all of these people who are getting infected now have seen, Zang have seen dengue and other closely related flaviviruses. So maybe that background of having seen a closely related virus, now seeing this virus, maybe there's some sort of um, immune stimulation that's going on and then leading to Guillain-Barre. So how do we diagnose this infection? Well, just like all arboviruses, we're left with either a PCR diagnosis, trying to find the virus, or serology, looking at the human immune response to the virus. And so if you get someone in the first few days of illness, you can do PCR. Um, in the serum, the virus only stays for about four or five days. It's actually quite short. Um, but there are studies coming out that saliva and urine may be better places to actually find this virus and that saliva and urine can have um, PCR, people who have Zika can still have um, PCR positives in their saliva and urine about a month after um, their initial disease. If you don't catch someone during that early time period and you can't get PCR diagnosis, then you're sort of left with serologic diagnosis. And unfortunately for for us, um, these, because these viruses are so closely related, um, y if you've seen dengue virus before, you're your Zika virus serology is, is going to be positive, and so it's very difficult to rely on a serologic diagnosis. How do we prevent these infections? Well, you don't get bitten by infected mosquitoes. You use repellents. You can use permethrin. Um, also, you have to change your behavior, which can sometimes be difficult. Stay indoors, wear long sleeves, um, use air conditioners, clean out standing waters. Easier to do here than, than where these outbreaks are happening in the world. And then finally, abstain or practice safe sex. As I've told you, and the CDC has now released, you know, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, guidelines about, um, you know, sex and being pregnant and when, you know, if you have a traveler to a Zika-related um, country and so forth. So how do we treat these? And unfortunately, this infection, there's no specific antiviral. We don't have any vaccines, so it's really just supportive care. And then importantly, right now, during these outbreaks where there is dengue and chikungunya also transmitting, we need to make sure we rule out those infections, especially dengue, because um, we don't want to give NSAIDs or aspirin to a person with dengue because, of course, that can increase their risk of hemorrhagic fever. So we have to rule that out before we, we give those to Zika patients. And then, of course, when you're in a hospital setting or at home, you need to be under a mosquito net just so you can't continue the transmission to uninfected vectors. 
There are lots of CDC guidelines. I'm not going to go through all this, but um, about pregnant women just avoiding travel, and if they can't avoid travel and they're worried, you know, they need to be tested um, either in serum or amniotic fluid, and then have serial ultrasounds performed to follow the baby in um, consultation with, of course, specialists. As far as babies, we need to do comprehensive exams and also eye exams and then follow them over time with the appropriate infectious disease and pediatric neurology specialists. And then finally, babies who we really think had congenital Zika, we need to continue to follow up. We don't know if it's progressive, we don't know what's going to happen with them, so hearing screens and then, of course, really finally following their milestones over life and giving them the support they need, which is easier to do again here than a lot of the countries that are going to be overwhelmed with these kids. Who is still establishing guidelines? They just say that all the cases should be tested. Um, and what's really left to do? There are a lot of research gaps here. Of course, Obama ha um, has um, given $1.8 billion for Zika virus research, a lot of which is going to CDC um, for, for their studies that they're doing right now, and then also to NIH to help build a vaccine. But we still have a lot of basic research gaps on the epidemiology spectrum of disease, a lot to do around vector control, since that's all we have right now to actually prevent this infection, and targeted therapeutics. And I'm just going to leave you with a very short story. So. Um, are pretty much the only place in the U.S. that, th that has seen um, local transmission repeatedly of these infections are Texas and Florida. And this, they're sort of our Caribbean, right? And so um, there are huge populations of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus in Florida. Um, and so the FDA recently okayed um, genetically modified mosquitoes to use to decrease the the numbers of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus in Florida to worry about if Zika is going to be you know, introduced. We're seeing a lot of introduced infections and just to decrease the risk of local transmission in Florida. And these mosquitoes, are what they are is they're males that they release, and these males mate with wild-type females. They have to outcompete the wild-type males to mate with these females, and then when they mate, the babies die. And so these mosquitoes have been shown to really decrease within a matter of months the numbers, the percentage of, of these mosquitoes that are out. And they've been tested in many different countries, and there are open field trials right now going on in the Grand Caymans in Malaysia and in Brazil and soon Florida. But of course, the Florida residents are a little bit nervous about releasing genetically modified mosquitoes in their backyards. So more to come on that. But so again, why does this keep happening? Global travel, climate change, urbanization, and I just want to bring up the fact that these are really neglected diseases that impact neglected tropical populations that are generally poor. So these are really diseases of, of impoverished people, and I think it's important to, to talk about that and to know that and to do something about it. Um, we're constantly taken off guard because we have a very reactive and not proactive climate right now in media and funding, and we need to change that because there are a lot more scarier diseases out there that no one's talking about that could easily come here and wreak havoc, and so we need to be better prepared. So in conclusion, arboviruses are quite common around the world. They're causing large outbreaks. Zika has been causally linked now to congenital defects. Large outbreaks can have devastating effects by both direct pathogen effects, which can be short-term and very long-term, as in the case of Zika, and by bystander effects on food, shelter, and care. Unfortunately, a lot of what we know for, uh, about Zika comes from research a long time ago, and so there's a lot of research gaps that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. And um, at this point, I think we have a, cu a couple of minutes to take um, any questions that the audience might have. And if you would like to come up to the microphones and ask uh, a question or two, we have some time. Thank you, Lee. Hi, yes. Um, a question uh, mainly for David and Phil. Uh, I was visiting a, a baby who was born yesterday. Uh, here at, at the nursery, uh, and his parents, one of them, one of my best friends, were very excited about routine bio, uh, microbiome transplant for um, newborn infants. And I'm wondering um, about your opinion on that and the, the role, the current and future role of prophylactic microbiome transplants. <clears throat> I'll, I'll make a, <coughs> excuse me, a quick comment. Um, I, I recognize uh, a great deal of interest in trying to um, manage um, this, this interesting contributing factor to health and disease. And there's certainly a couple of very specific cases and settings in which 
management has proven to be um, effective in, in guiding the system back to a state of health. Those circumstances are, are quite limited in number, though, and I think it reflects the fact that we still don't understand, in fact, that topological landscape I showed and what it takes to shift a community from one stable state to another. Certain circumstances lend themselves quite, um, quite easily to manipulation and shift. Most do not, and, and many of Phil's colleagues and others around the world are now um, working in earnest to try to understand how do we modify that landscape and, and promote um, the kinds of shifts that we, we think are useful and, and yet don't yet know how. So I'd caution. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you again for a great series of talks. Um, mm -hmm. I had a follow-up question about Zika. So um, is it, what is the state of thinking about how long Zika can um, remain in a host and potentially affect babies' brains? So for example, women who are in Brazil now and are infected but not pregnant, um, do they have to worry if they plan on getting pregnant two months in the future, a year in the future? Yes, yeah, so the understanding is is that the reason why the fetus gets infected is because so the mother gets bitten by the mosquito and then gets viremic. So she has virus in her blood that then traffics to the placenta, uses axle to cross the centrosome trophoblast into the fetus, and then gets to the neuroprogenital cells all during the, that period of viremia, which again is quite short, only about a, maybe a week at the, at the most. And so anybody who's of childbearing age who maybe gets Zika now shouldn't have any lasting effects from the virus, unless they're the unfortunate few that end up with Guillain-Barre or something like that. Otherwise, it should not r risk any future pregnancies for that mother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. I'd like to, again, thank the, um, our uh, wonderful panel of speakers.